Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Larry Hogan delivers upbeat State of the State address to a wary General Assembly. Democrat Quiesi Fume and Republican Kimberly Klasik to face off in race to succeed Elijah Cummings. Gallup poll shocker, race relations better under Donald Trump than Barack Obama. Seriously, get out of here. And high drama at the State of the Union address. Stay tuned, our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by the former Majority Leader of the Maryland House of Delegates, John Herson. Secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, Mark Unkelfer. Republican National Committee woman, Nicolee Ambrose. And the former Mayor of Rockville, Susan Hoffman. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. The press described Maryland Governor Larry Hogan's State of the State address as tidy, upbeat, bipartisan, and generous. While the atmosphere was mostly positive, as Josh Kurtz reports in Maryland Matters, beneath the surface was the reality that the Democratic General Assembly and the Republican governor are not on the same page with respect to taxes and spending. But for the day, the governor had the stage and he addressed the need to stem the violence in Baltimore City, the need to compromise on the endless gerrymandering issue and finally his commitment to build and fund education, but not at the cost of driving taxpayers out of the state. John, there's a new speaker in the House, Adrian Jones, a new president in, in the Senate, Bill Ferguson, and they're not inclined to give up their wishes to the governor on his signature tax relief and on his proposal. So are they dead on arrival? You know what, I actually don't think so. I think there's a way for this legislature to get along with a popular uh, Republican governor. Um, he is not, you know, dyed in the wool, um, you know, Stepford wives like all the other senators in the United States Congress, um, you know, to Trump, but he is more of a negotiator. And I think he can make a deal with them on the school funding issue and his signature retirees, you know, benefit, which I'm saying I want part of that. And um, so I think he, he actually can make a deal because I think people like him. And I think that's, that's something that can happen. I don't think it's dead on arrival at where all. Where are they gonna find the money, John? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I will tell you a little story. When I was down there uh, as majority leader and um, Paris Glendening came in and, and told the House, which was a little more reluctant to spend the money in the Thornton, previous education program, he just said, you guys are going to vote for this because it's education. And he was right. That's what's going to happen. They're going to vote for it. They'll find the money, some of it now, some of it later, but it's going to happen. Nicolay, the governor is extremely popular, and, but he, the reality is there's a super majority of Democrats in the House and in the Senate. Where, where do they find a compromise, and how does Larry translate his popularity into preventing tax increases, which has kept him popular, and the, and the General Assembly's demand for more money. Right, and right with Kerwin alone, we're talking four billion more dollars. And we all know, for example, with education, money is not the answer. We have Baltimore City with the highest amount per pupil spent at over 18,000 per child, and we cannot teach half of our children to read, write, and do arithmetic when they graduate from high school. So knowing that money is not the answer, and knowing that Marylanders like fiscally responsible governors, and adding on that we have two of three governors in this century being Republicans in the seemingly blue state of Maryland, we are looking to 2022. The Democrats will work their way out of the supermajority if they go off the cliff to the left and spend money we don't have that have no demonstrable Dreaming. results. Well, we got to find money in, the, in, in this election, in this uh, political cycle, in, this, in this, this legislature. Susan, also emphasized by the governor, was the violence and crime in Baltimore City. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, House Majority Leader Eric Ledke said, Governor Hogan's proposals are 1950 solutions for a night for a, ni a new problem today. Well, the Republican, um, but the Democratic uh, team 
um, has put together a broad legislative package um, in response to the Republican governor. Um, reducing violent crime um, would include um, access to programs that um, that that cut the um, that that I'm sorry that that cut recidivism, that provide uh, jobs and training. Um, we have to be looking at um, educating. Uh, young people for the jobs that we need and so they're not we're not talking about sending everybody to college but we're talking about well, those are long-term solutions right. for a short-term problem what I heard was the most ludicrous thing I've heard come out of Baltimore was that they were going to model them their pr new crime program on Chicago where, sh where where crime is rampant there needs to be uh, programs that can be put in place today Existing laws need to be enforced. They need to be broad, and um, so we because we do have laws on the books that that absolutely would it's, work, but they have to be enforced. Well, let's agree, it's not a function of of changing the laws. It's a changing the criminal justice system to be more effective. New York City went through this whole process. Much larger city drove down the murder rate much more effective with much more effective policing than we've had in, in Baltimore. So changing the social start, you know, s social policies or social legislation really isn't the answer. But, but Mark, it's using the lessons but it was, those are the very programs that Democrats are trying to overturn throughout the country. Well, one of the things that they're working on is trying to get illegal guns, illegal guns off the streets. Absolutely. And, that and that's part of the Ho Hogan. Hogan, th th here's an area where there's potential agreement because yeah. Dealing with illegal guns has been part of the Hogan proposal, so let's let's at least acknowledge that and and let's move forward with it. And it is also part of what is, what the Democrats are proposing in their program. So well, there is there is common no, ground. You guys, there. you guys are talking about something where there's compromise. Yes, and there can be compromise. And I, I mean, I still have faith in both the legislators who are practical, right. and it's not all about money and everything else. But who know how to cut a deal, and well, and I think Hogan's the, the kind of guy who can cut. But John, there has to be a willingness from the mayor of Baltimore to want to enforce the laws as well. Absolutely, because one of the things that was done in New York was the <clears throat> now controversial stop and frisk right. process, right. which did a great job of getting guns off the street because yeah, it identified it was, it was, it was a civil Nicoli, rights problem. Real quick, because I got to go on to another topic. So you just have to look at these numbers, and we need results. New York City has 8.55 million people, Baltimore 600,000, and Baltimore City's murder rate is higher. We keep talking about throwing money at problems. We need to talk about actual results in keeping people alive. And we're Agreed. talking for about education. enforcing existing laws. We so agree. it's not necessarily money. Now, look, we got to go on. I want to, I want to go on to the next. Mark, we were going to talk about redistricting, but I want to talk more about the District 7 race. So, John. Yeah. This week, this week there was a primary yep. to succeed Elijah Cummings, yep. and we have Quasi and Fume as the Democratic nominee, mm -hmm. and Kimberly Klasik as the Republican. Right. What happened to Rocky Moore Cummings? Uh, look, I think you know when you get into districts that are predominantly Baltimore City, somebody like Lafumi, who has a history there, who left that seat, you know, to go take over the NAACP. I mean, he still has a huge following. I was not surprised by the result at all. Um, I mean, look, she's a wonderful woman, and I think, you know, uh, Elijah Cummings was my friend, and it was very hard to see him go, but this guy, Mifumi, had a long-term relationship with that district, so I wasn't surprised by the result. So, Nicolay, tell us a little bit about Kimberly Clasic, because we here in Montgomery County know nothing about her. We'd like to know something about her. Sure. Well, I, I have to say, I think this race is, was totally fascinating because it's old school versus new school, right? You had Kim Klasek, Liz Matori, two very energetic, young black Republican females who used social media to the hilt in their campaigns very effectively versus Mfume, who ran, you know, who's been known by generations in the seventh district and in Maryland and really ran an old school campaign. So I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. Kim obviously was the, the one many of us have heard of who did videos about the garbage piled up in Baltimore City, especially right outside Elijah Cummings registered address. And 
when people went in to help clean up the trash, they were criticized for making picking up trash political instead of saying, wow, just thanks for helping, period, so, thanks for helping. So she's continued to use social media very effectively, and she had a solid 40-plus percent of the vote. Well, the, because this is a special election, mm -hmm. the general election will be on the same day that the primary election for the for another term right. is also being is also going to be con contested. What is the likelihood that we're going to see an upset in April? Do you mean that the Republican wins? Absolutely Susan. zero. That was the question. <laughs> Can Kimberly Kasich win? Oh. Is the Susan, question. He, here's the key to I it. I think it's amusing if, that you're even asking. Susan, question, if, but, <laughs> if Baltimore, Mark, you're going to have, a, have to wrap it up. If Baltimore uses the same software as the Democrats use. <laughs> We're going to win. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> dagger, Mark. That was a dagger. When we come back from this short break, are race relations better under Donald Trump than Barack Obama? That was a question, Mark. And Arctic freeze hits the U.S. Congress during President Trump's State of the Union message. Stay tuned. And welcome back. Because February is African American History Month, it's typical for reports to be released on the status of race relations in America at the beginning of this month. This year, a new Gallup poll reported the satisfaction with race relations and the position of minorities under President Trump are higher than they were under Barack Obama. Mark, according to Gallup's Americans' average satisfaction rating for the 27 issues that they've tracked since 2001 is at 47 percent, the highest that it's been since 2005. But why should we believe this report? Well, outside of Washington, which has been so focused on Washington things like impeachment, the economy has been much better than it has been in, what, 50 plus years. Um, so there's a lot of things to be very satisfied about the way things are going in this country. And those are the things that really affect how people react. And by coincidence, in 2005, we were in a good economy Absolutely. at the time. So it really is about the economy as much as it is about race. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Susan, the con conclusions of the Gallup poll seem at odds with what we hear in the media every day, that racism is pervasive in our society. But when I look around our community and I see the interactions of blacks and whites in their er everyday lives, they seem much better. So it, are my eyes lying to me or are my ears lying to me? I'm not sure who's lying to you, Casey, but I think what, what's interesting is that Montgomery County is a, a, an example of a place where there is less racism than the average in the, in the country. I think racism still exists significantly in certain parts of the country more than others. And um, the reason that things look really good now, programs take a long time to to impact. So things that are happening that look good now may have actually been put into place, legislation and things like that, many, many years before, decades before civil rights and so forth. So the opportunity for African Americans to, to um, succeed has taken a very long time. So, uh, Nicolay, there was another report in the study released by Wallet Hub that reports that the state of Maryland ranks ninth in racial integration and 11th among states that have made progress in, ra in race relations. But the critics report that the study concentrates on the outcomes and not on opportunity. So what is the problem with an opportunity-based society? Well, I have to tell you, blending both that last conversation and this one, you know, at times things can be generational, but my view is I view someone on the content of their character, not that of their skin color. And when we're looking at things uh, such as opportunity, we can talk about opportunity all day long, but the question is what are the results? And right now we have the lowest black unemployment rate in ever recorded. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, literally we have the lowest black unemployment rate number ever recorded. When we look at a city like Baltimore, which has been talked about much in this show so far, we cannot even educate half of the graduates of those schools well enough to read, write, or do arithmetic, spending $18,000 on each child. That is criminal. So it John, is wrong. So, so we need to say, provide basic, basic things like education. I am fine if the government provides 
good education, but if you cannot do it, give school choice and the options to these children so they can get their life off on the right foot. John, John we, we've talked a lot about two different, two different issues related to race. So, I mean, are race relations better solely because we have better economic numbers? And the, what Nicoli is talking about is in continuing and improving the, the, uh, the opportunity for African Americans and all people in Maryland through better education. Um, look, I think economics is a huge part of it. I really do. I think that was a, a great point, Mark. Um, the fact that we are in a, a very strong economy makes all the edges of racial equality a little less sharp. I'm a little reluctant to comment on this on an all-white panel. I mean, I think that's a little bit of a problem, but you've asked me. So I, I think when you look at you know, disparity across the state, I think it really depends on where you live. I mean, I don't, I think Susan had a good point. I mean, Montgomery County has less of that problem, although you go over into Flower Avenue and, you know, you look at the Hispanic and the, that culture over there is not the same as Chevy Chase. And um, I, I also think it's, it's true in Baltimore. When you look at Baltimore, you, you cannot compare what's happening in West Baltimore with what's happening in, you know, the upper echelons of Towson. I mean, it's just, it, there is a disparity there. It's real. Even with the economy softening the edges, the disparity is there. And I think we always have to keep thinking about it. it you know, it's the original sin of the founding of the, of the uh, country, and that's true. And, and it's, it's something we all need to work on. Well, uh, it's, it, this, is, this is not a topic we're going to resolve this, this, this evening, no. but we're going to focus the, on this topic for the rest of the month, given the importance of African, uh, Black History Month. We're going to talk about it each and every week through, throughout the rest of the month. So we want to go on to our last topic. <clears throat> What a week for competitive sports on display. If the outcome of the Super Bowl between the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers wasn't satisfying enough, I had my money on the 49ers, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Too bad. The political gainsmanship that occurred on Tuesday night as President Trump delivered the State of the Union speech to Congress had to be one for the ages. From the President's refusal to shake the Speaker's hand, culminating in the demonstrative shredding of the printed address by Mrs. Pelosi almost before the President Trump had finished. It was a night of high tension and high drama. John, the day after the State of the Union, uh, Union the United States Senate acquitted President Trump of the House Bill of Impeachment. Now, you can criticize the Washington Post writer David Van Driel, who thinks it was predictable because the House did, handed him a disastrous decision to halt their investigation and presented a gapingly incomplete record to an unwelcoming Senate. Um, Casey, you and I are going to disagree about what this, the House did. Um, I thought the House passed over their articles of um, impeachment because they had the evidence. I, don't, I never saw anybody on the Republican side refute any of that evidence. So look, you might be right. They could have waited more time, gotten more evidence. But you know, Nancy Pelosi never wanted to do impeachment. She didn't want to do it. And then she got handed this thing by the president where he invoked you know, a foreign leader to come and inter interfere in elections. So she had to do it. She made it go as quickly as she possibly could. It's over. You know, the Stepford wives in the Senate you know, acquitted him. You know, um, that, you know, it's done. It's so, so we're it's over. So it's, you, you're, you're absolutely right, John. We, we differ 180 <laughs> degrees on this. And, but it's so, it's so interesting that we talk about the Stepford Wives in, in, the, in the Senate when we had the actual Stepford Wives all in white in the House yeah. the, night, the, the night of the, the State of the Union address. I mean, you, you say that there wasn't enough evidence. Well, no, I, I mean, said the there was enough evidence. There, no, the Republicans weren't allowed to present any evidence in the House. That's absolutely there was plenty, that is, there was that plenty is, of time is, for them the to do that. The, 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 they did. All the, pres the president's and lawyer all was the not admitted. The president couldn't call None witnesses. Of that is true. Yes, they he could. could. That's they, absolutely they, they couldn't have their day true. of witnesses in the house. So you they could, refused so, to provide any documents. No, 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 so, Susan, you're talking about two different things. Yeah. 
No, you're I'm talking, talking about, about the House. Is, you're talking the ability of Republicans in the House to present evidence. What you're talking about they, is they, they had, had every that opportunity. They, they Mark, did they did. Have, they did. Of they course did in the Judiciary Committee. Where they could have had the, the, the president's conference. They were locked in, in a high the, security room in the basement and it wouldn't even let in Republicans. And all the Republicans. No, that's not true. That's not true. You're listening to Fox News. They were in there. Talking about any Republican congressman I know who has repeatedly said they would not even let me in. They, they were, were lying secure. to you. It's Do you a, believe that? They were like, in the security Oh, my God. Right, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a, I want to go to Mark on this because obviously <laughs> We differ. Uh, John, John, so, mentioned, John mentioned that Nancy didn't want to do impeachment, and, and I think that probably was, was true at the beginning. I will tell you the strategist that I spoke to November of 2018 said she absolutely cannot resist the demands of her caucus to go down impeachment, and she didn't, and, and well, she couldn't. And, and the results were unquestionably not the results that she intended when she started the process. The case certainly did not move the needle in terms of what public opinion thought. You couldn't even get people into the gallery. Fifty percent of the public I, thought he should be removed. The numbers. Seventy-five percent wanted documents. Documents and, and evidence. Ladies and, and gentlemen, this is the beauty. The beauty of this is that the impeachment trial is over. Thank God. Right. This first well, impeachment trial is first. <laughs> it is first over. Now we'll first see one, yeah. and get ready for the next one coming Go next ahead. week. Okay. So stay tuned for parting shots when we come back <laughs> from this short break. <laughs> and now with parting shots, Mark Unkefer. Earlier this week, our colleagues here at MC Media reported on the work that NIH uh, scientists are doing in trying to find a vaccine for the coronavirus. Uh, it's a really reminder of the wonderful work that so many individuals and institutions do here in Montgomery County to advance public health and we wish them well in this particular endeavor as well. Thank you, Mark. John Herson, your parting shot. Uh, my parting shot is a shout out to a nonprofit that's based up in Frederick. Um, it's called uh, Give America Hope. I'm working with a former Republican colleague, uh, Matt Mossberg. Uh, it's trying to find solutions to the opioid uh, treatment problem. Um, more than 91% of the people who are treated for opioid addiction relapse, and most of the deaths occur in the relapse. And there's a whole system that's being developed by um, University of North Carolina to actually come up with a predictive model that can be used by uh, physicians and people doing uh, treatment to predict whether or not people are gonna relapse. So my shout out is to um, Charlie Seymour, who's the chairman of that group, and to Matt Mossberg, who's uh, the executive director. Thank you, John. And now with parting shots, Nicola Ambrose. So coming out of the week of the National Prayer Breakfast, there has been an exciting focus on religious freedom and liberty. Um, there's this thing called the International Religious Freedom Roundtable in Washington, D.C. And um, I presented on behalf of the Republican National Committee this week four resolutions the RNC has passed on religious freedom in the past two years. Uh, one of the things we're particularly concerned about, uh, Pew did a study recently that in the past 10 years, there's been a tremendous uptick in government-sponsored persecution around the world. And we now have 245 million Christians alone at risk of high persecution, followed by Muslims and Jews. So the goal here is religious liberty really should be a bipartisan issue. Um, but I really commend the Trump administration on their leadership on this issue across the globe. They've been using every diplomatic tool and the State Department's been doing a fabulous job hosting ministerials on religious freedom to encourage good behavior by the world's actors. Thank you, Nicola. Susan Hoffman, thank, is your, you get the opportunity to take the end of the parting shots. Thank you, Casey. So um, as a student of history and, um, and a student of politics, uh, I was uh, thrilled and I hope our audience was thrilled to see a demonstration of great political courage uh, on, on uh, Wednesday. And that was um, the votes taken by uh, Senator Mitt Romney from Utah, who he knew um, would, would not go well for him, but he did what he thought he needed to do, and Senator Doug Jones from Alabama, a very red state, although he is a Democrat, uh, and did the same thing, both men invoking their fathers. 
Thank you, Susan. I want to thank the panel for being here, but especially I want to thank Susan Hoffman, who filled in at the very last minute for uh, a Democrat from Baltimore uh, that couldn't be here, Anthony uh, McCarthy. And I want to thank the panel, I mean, the, the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.